Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we have about, uh, about 50 people uh, registered for the webinar, so we'll start in about a minute, give the last few folks a chance to log on. Um, we'll be talking about outcomes-driven customer research and some tools to, to do that, uh, and creating value using a process that we've named problem identification and extraction to help you uh, make some better strategic decisions. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. I'm Robert Enzerink. I'm a partner and a senior consultant with the Market Tech Group. Uh, we're glad you could all attend. Uh, the Market Tech Group, we're specialists in medical technology marketing research and strategy consulting. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Now, a number of our guests have submitted some questions to the Market Tech Group prior to today's webinar, and I've tried to incorporate those where possible. Also, uh, we encourage you, as things come up during the webinar, to text questions into the webinar question box that should be up on your screen. And we'll address many of those as we can during today's discussion, either during the discussion or afterwards. Um, I hope everyone can see that box. If we don't get to your question, I apologize, and we'll try to answer it afterwards. So with respect to everyone's time, let's get started. In the next 45 minutes or so, you'll learn uh, the difference between benefits and desired outcomes, some methodologies to extract pain points and those desired outcomes, how to apply the PI methodology to your studies, the problem identification and extraction methodology, and how to articulate your findings uh, and the desired outcomes, your customer's desired outcomes, for better business success, articulating that for your R&D and marketing teams in particular. And of course, the end result is that you should have some tools at the end of these 45 minutes uh, so that you can do further research and, and investigate uh, in the right direction to develop the right products, pitch them, and sell them at the right price to your customers. So a challenge that marketers and product developers and vendors to the medical industry, and actually every industry, but particularly in the medical industry, often face is that customers often cannot articulate a solution or describe a product or technology they want in a way that's useful for you. And there's a real problem with asking your potential customers, what do you want? Because if you build a product based on what customers say is important, they'll tell you everything's important and you design something that looks like this. Uh, it's a combination of many, many things that, that are important, but you haven't been able to really filter out and target what you really need. And if you find out that customers say they're willing to pay $1.50 for that, but then in the real world, they go and they buy this. They spend $16 and they buy something that's very different from what they told you was important. And the reason customers have trouble telling you what they want in a way that's useful for you is because they either get stuck on modifications to current solutions or your marketing research doesn't ask questions in a way that allows them to give you the insights that you really need. And that's the target for our talk today. In the end, it's not about building what customers say they want. It's about building what they will buy. That's a much better business model. So and what your customers are likely to buy is a product that best helps them achieve their desired outcomes. A focus of our study today is to understand how to design the product on the left that people buy for $15.99 that has relatively low versatility, even though they told you that was very important and they're only willing to pay $1.50. It's safe, but it has minimal functionality. The product on the right, the one that they told you, that, that's a combination of all the things they told you was important, might cost $80. It's highly versatile, which they said was important. It is less safe, but it has the greatest functionality, which they told you is very important. The key is it's not portable, which is something you didn't ask about. So it's important that your marketing research needs to uncover what is the customer's job to be done, their desired outcome to make that research valuable. And the job to be done is a concept that's promoted heavily by Tony Olick at Stratagen, and it's very important here in understanding uh, the, a way to approach getting to desired outcomes. And what you find is a potential desired outcome for 
this particular group of customers that I need to be able to open these packages and medicine bottles when I visit my patients. That's a desired outcome. And inherent in that is this idea of portability, which we didn't think to ask about when we started asking our customers what's important. So how do you identify these desired outcomes if your customers can't even tell you? And that's the goal of problem identification and extraction, a process that you can do to really understand those unmet needs and the desired outcomes your customers are looking for. So problem identification and extraction is a process that helps medtech vendors innovate by understanding your customers' desired outcomes and the solutions that fit those challenges that help them achieve their desired outcomes. Now why do you need to understand the problem? There's been a tendency and there, there still is a tendency, particularly among salespeople, to focus on features and benefits. But if you don't really understand the problem, these benefits may not be addressing the real core desired outcome, and we'll show you some examples of that. But solutions are only valuable, those, those features and benefits are only valuable if they're developed for, the, for a problem that really exists, and the more painful that problem, the more valuable the solution. But finding a customer's pain isn't as easy as asking them, as we just saw. And often customers focus on solutions and benefits, the technologies, without articulating the real desired outcome that they're looking for. So a pie process extracts the most painful problems and the desired outcomes using skilled queries and putting respondents in trade-off scenarios and real-life situations. And we'll give you some tools to do that. So an example, and this is the classic example of a whole that Theodore Levitt proposed uh, many years ago, in fact a few decades ago in his book Marketing Myopia. The concept of customers going out and buying a five millimeter drill bit, that's what they think they want and companies tend to sell faster, cheaper, cleaner cut. But they're really missing the point because the desired outcome of course is a five millimeter hole. What customers really want is an accurate five millimeter hole. Now to truly, truly create value today, it's most productive to move from a focus on features and benefits to understanding the desired outcomes. A medical example, point of care tests. Simplifying things quite a bit, the real value of point of care tests is presented as a benefit of faster results. We get results faster. But if that result is not meeting a desired outcome, which of course is really not a fast result, but more targeted patient therapy. If that result is fast, but it's not diagnostic, it's not highly predictive, it really isn't completely meeting the, the customer's desired outcomes. It's meeting it partially. Another example would be imaging technologies, whether it's MRI or ultrasound or something else. It's often sold and presented as, as being something that has better image quality. The next generation imaging product has better image quality. But is that really the, the desired outcome that customers are looking for by buying a new MR? Of course not. You're getting a sense now, the real outcome that they're looking for is better diagnoses. So by f moving your discussion from features and benefits to understanding desired outcomes, you'll better be able to meet customers' needs. And that customer focus of, of focusing on, on solutions and uh, is, is going to be very helpful because customers may not be able to articulate the solution or describe the products and technology they want, but they can always describe and they always know what they want in terms of outcomes. It's a matter of having that discussion in a way that gets to those outcomes. And the challenge is to distinguish between solutions and desired outcomes, which can also be described as problems or needs. Important thing to keep in mind is that Technologies and solutions change over time, but desired outcomes tend to be stable. Uh, for example, surgeons and patients didn't know they wanted laparoscopic surgery many years ago, but they did know the desired outcomes that they wanted. They wanted faster recovery. They wanted fewer complications and infections, uh, less collateral damage, smaller incisions, less scarring, and ability to operate on higher risk patients. Those customer desired outcomes are consistent. They've been that way since medicine started and is still that way today. But they couldn't necessarily define the technology that they wanted. So keep in mind as we go through this and when you do your research that 
technology and solutions do change over time. But getting to the desired outcomes, those desired outcomes tend to be stable. And the better your technology and solutions achieve those desired outcomes, the more successful your product will be. When you're able to accurately identify the most painful problems and desired outcomes, then you can focus on developing those valuable solutions. And the most valuable healthcare solutions best accomplish the desired outcomes in terms of speed, consistency, and results. And that's not just medical technology, really any product that helps you, helps the customer faster, more predictably, produce higher outputs to get to their desired results will be the most valuable solution. So what we're going to cover today is what are methods to successfully identifying those desired outcomes using examples of outcomes-based innovation research that we call problem identification and extraction. Almost every research project has a phase one, which is a qualitative and sometimes semi-quantitative voice of customer investigation. This research is to get the lay of the land. It's most useful for uh, broad strategic decision making. Uh, it can be things like probing key issue, issues facing customers today, collecting and identifying 20 problems or 15 problems that can be improved today. Uh, it can take the form of assessing differences by segment. And it's important to remember also that desired outcomes may be different for and specific to different groups or segments. Um, and it, it can allow outcomes-based segmentation as a follow-on, uh, which we'll talk about as well. So remember that desired outcomes may be different for different groups or, or segments. So an example um, of this phase one, a variety of research methodologies are used, but voice of customer is used to identify the understanding of pain points and frustrations, qualitative and observational research, um, the value is to collect the behavioral, emotional, and usage elements of current products or processes. And the benefit of doing qualitative processes is that you can collect out-of-the-box novel ways to identify and describe the problem, which will get to the desired outcome. The specific methodologies, the techniques, um, observational research, uh, in-depth interviews, uh, focus groups, key opinion leader workshops, is going to be determined by the inputs that you're looking for. And the process involves identifying each step and the pain points at each step of achieving the end result and understanding what the desired outcome is. It's important not to focus on what they're doing. Say, for instance, when you're doing observational research and maybe you're observing a janitorial service cleaning a floor. What you want to observe is not what they are doing, mopping the floor, but what they're trying to accomplish they're trying to accomplish getting the floor cleaner. So it's important to be need-oriented and be specific when you do this type of research, whether it's observational or in a discussion setting. So some examples. The first example we'll talk about is a, a post-op rehab knee brace, a range of motion brace. And the background was that um, this engineering team uh, and marketing team was investigating design improvements for a rehab brace. Uh, the methodology that was used uh, was observational and ethnographic research, uh, observing and documenting the process steps, and understanding the interactions that the customers had with the product, the patients, the clinicians, the technicians, the nurses. And the focus was on the process steps for the job to be done. What are the needs, the problems, and the desired outcomes for each step? And the reason we chose, and someone asked the question, uh, to highlight why choose different methodologies, so I'll try to, to do that with each example. The reason to choose observational or, or ethnographic research is when the setting impacts who is using the product and how they use it. For example, in the hospital, it's the nurse that's using the product primarily, a physical therapist in a clinic, uh, or the patient at home or a locker room. For this study, we identified that because the hospital is the buying customer and the focus was on the hospital use. The specific processes and special skills uh, and <laughs> to identify the specific processes and the steps and the observations requires special skills. Uh, you'll need to create a workflow. You have to observe the context. Listen and observe for the qualitative steps. When do people complain? Uh, when do they smile? Um, and observational experts 
will be the people in your team that are process oriented, they're metric oriented, and they're objective. They can provide an objective assessment. So the team went in and watched this process in the hospital of putting this brace on a patient. And the results and findings, among others, one key finding was that a significant portion of the time was spent preparing the brace to be placed on the patient. Uh, one of the people being observed said, time is money. These straps and fasteners are a real time suck. Uh, the brace was taken out of the box vertically. And, and if you remember looking at this brace, there are a lot of straps. There's a lot of Velcro, the hook and loop closures. Uh, and the brace was basically supplied in the box closed up like this as if it were around a person's leg. Uh, the nurse had to take the brace out of the box, unstrap all the Velcro, it tended to get tangled up, um, and then get it behind the patient, then mess with the straps some more. So the, the focus of engineering had been looking at improvements to the technology, better straps, buckles, uh, changing the, the way that the uh, straps were on the brace, making stiffer, thinner straps, uh, etc. But one of the desired outcomes that was identified was an effective range of motion brace that is quick to initially apply post-operatively and easy to explain to the patient in the clinic. So there were, the team was working on a lot of these things and one of the engineers identified a completely different solution by focusing on this unmet need. It wasn't a comment about we need better buckles or better straps. The comment was we need to just be able to apply this brace quickly. So he came up with a very clever solution change the design of the box and instead of packing the brace closed up and wrapped up, pack it in so that it's open, it's unfolded like an open book, it can just be lifted out, put behind the patient's leg and closed up over their leg. Saved a significant amount of time, very clever solution and it met this desired outcome. By understanding the desired outcome, the team approached the problem with a different perspective. A second example, imaging system. This was an imaging system uh, project for improving a, an imaging system, focusing on really the um, a, a global strategy. And this particular part of the study was in one developing market. There were many of them. The methodology that was chosen was a focus group. And the focus group method uh, is chosen when you have a high-level global strategic uh, overview or need and you want to select respondents or, or you have the opportunity to select respondents for each distinct key market. In this case, it was one developing market. And then you can repeat that focus group or multiple focus groups in other markets. The reason to choose a focus group in this case was that because it was an overall global product portfolio and strategic road mapping exercise, it was important to engage different stakeholders in each of these markets and understand what their high-level needs were to drive that high-level product roadmap. The benefit of a focus group in this case was that you could engage different stakeholders and you can select people from different business segments and engage them in a dialogue and in particular engage them in a debate and understand why different groups have different needs. It's an opportunity to highlight the differences and exchange various rationales to get to the why. Why did people have particular needs? so that you can better understand their desired outcomes. As part of that, we used a five why process. And in this case, a key finding was that customers are focused on the business of imaging. There was a clear interest in this group, less on the technology and image quality, but rather on uptime and other elements of operational efficiency. And the way we approached this was, was one by monitoring the words that they were using and presenting to them a word map. And if you look at this word map, the first thing that jumped out at us, uh, and would to you as well, was that there's very little about technology here. It's application, it's support, it's about the patient, maintenance, and right in the middle, power and cost. And focusing in on that, uh, we notice quotes like this gentleman, power is very important because it is high cost and there's a shortage. So we used a 5Y technique that went something like this. The, the, the first two hours of this half day session, really the technology and image quality hadn't come up much. 
So we asked, why haven't you talked about the technology and image quality? The answer was, well, it's good enough. Then why are you unhappy? Because there was still quite a bit of uh, unhappiness. And there was discussion about profits and business and cost. Why is this business environment challenging? There's discussion about uptime, throughput, patient management, power. Then the question was, why did a few of you bring up power? And the answer was, demand is too high. Uh, you can't rely on the supply. There's a very high cost, and it was a very high, surprisingly high percentage of cost for a few of them. Why is power demand such a huge part of some of your cost structures? And the answer was there's insufficient infrastructure for the peak demands of some of these systems. It requires generators. Uh, some of these systems, if we want certain features, have other capabilities that our systems can't handle. But then we have to build generators and, and do a major remodeling of the entire facility's power systems and, and wiring and panels, maybe even regional. And there was a concern that these systems that they really would like to have offered features that caused problems for them and increased the cost dramatically because of infrastructure needs. So a desired outcome in this case was they're looking for an imaging system that allows me to operate my business efficiently within the existing infrastructure. And you may find as you do these types of studies, if you structure your discussion right, that you have aha moments like this that wouldn't otherwise come up if you just designed a survey based on what you already know. So this qualitative step is very important, especially when you're doing these high-level global strategic investigations. Now, two examples using a quantitative survey uh, step. Not all projects require a phase two. You may not need quantification of data, but business decisions often benefit from and, and will eventually require some quantitative analysis and evaluation of the problems you've identified and extracted. So there are different ways to do this. Usually you use a web survey and you use techniques like max diff, preference scales, trade-off tasks. And the real benefit here is now you can quantify the value of meeting the desired outcomes, uh, quantify uh, the pain and the problems. By quantifying things, you can identify not just what the unmet needs are, but the strength of those unmet needs and the value of achieving the desired outcomes, which is often translated as willingness to pay. So if you do a study where you're including a quantitative step, there may be some semi-quant that you do early on before you design a survey, for example. And then in phase two, you have a quantitative method uh, with some type of ranking and scoring. Uh, there are many ways to do this. The value, again, is that you can now quantify the outcomes. The specific methodology is, again, going to be dependent on the inputs you're looking for. You can use importance and satisfaction rating, trade-off testing like conjoint. But again, you have extracted the unmet needs at each step. Now you need to quantify how important those are. And in the end, your goal is still to articulate and now quantify the desired outcomes. In order to do this well, you'll need to do some type of a quantitative, qualitative analysis. Now you may already know this well enough so that you don't need to do a discrete qualitative step in your research, but usually it's required. And that both the quantitative and the qualitative steps, but particularly quantitative questions and rating scales have to be designed appropriately. They need to be needs oriented, just like the qualitative steps, but in this case they need to be very specific and the questions and the options need to be complete. They need to be concise to avoid fatigue. People are unlikely, especially busy hospital executives or physicians, are unlikely to spend 30, 40 minutes on a survey. So the survey needs to be concise to avoid fatigue and keep them engaged. And the question nature has to be consistent. Any variations in wording or syntax or configurations can dramatically alter priority orders or rankings given by customers. So number one and two, needs being needs oriented and specific and complete are ensured by a proper qualitative investigation before you quant design. Three and four, being concise and being consistent will depend on skilled experts designing your studies. So an example. 
In this case, a diagnostic product. This was a study to investigate user needs for improving a product design. So this is a methodology you could use when you're looking at um, specific product features. Uh, in this case, a combination of a KOL workshop, a key opinion leader workshop, and a survey was used. Uh, the qualitative step uh, workshop uses a technique called ORID, a, a focused conversation uh, that you may want to look up and investigate. It's useful uh, for these open-ended discussions, particularly with a large group, uh, to maintain control of a potentially freewheeling conversation uh, that can easily get shanghaied by loud and verbose participants. So if you have a group where you have, uh, say, surgeons and radiologists, uh, I'm generalizing, but often the surgeons will tend to speak a lot more and be more verbose than the radiologists who tend to be a, a more quiet group. And using a technique like ORID allows you to really focus the conversation and engage everyone. Um, or a technique like the focus conversation ORID also could help keep you getting derailed by irrelevant topics inside conversations. And then the quantitative step used a survey, uh, in this case a Mac Stiff tool to provide useful quantifiable information to guide not just the strategy, but in this case, uh, some particular product features. So what were the findings like? In this case, and again, remember, it's a hybrid type study with both qualitative and quantitative. Um, the customers needed most of all to have solutions to their business demands and profitability. And you'll find this in many of your studies today. That's a higher focus than it ever was before. And during the qualitative steps, we had comments like operational efficiency is an important aspect. Uh, we first have to serve our patients. Um, there's a lot of discussion about training and consulting and working with the people, the human interface, not just the technology. And marketing is still looking at specs rather than patient outcomes. The conversation was, again, not about image quality but it tended to be about uptime and service for operational efficiency and profitability. And the desired outcome, one of the desired outcomes, was that customers are looking for a product and vendor that helps to operate the business efficiently by providing near 100% uptime and high throughput with high diagnostic reliability, a big focus on operational efficiency. Now remember to articulate requirements not on the product features, but based on the ability to help customers achieve their desired outcomes. So this isn't talking about any product features. The outcome they're looking for is the desired outcomes of their business. So that qualitative step helped us to formulate and design a quantitative step, which is why we recommend that you do this. Uh, this is an example of a survey where we used a Mac Stiff. Um, rank ordering the most and least problematic items and most and least important outcomes. Uh, MaxDiff is a tool that you can use to force trade-off choices and provide useful quantifiable information. Uh, MaxDiff is nice because it's cognitively very easy to understand. Uh, it avoids scale bias and it's quick. Uh, we as humans easily identify extremes. It's the middle items that are tough. So MaxDiff is a nice tool that you can use to, to get through a survey quickly. And MaxDiff allows you to develop charts like this. Using the MaxDiff tool, you can plot the results on a matrix that can identify opportunities. And of course, opportunities are elements that are both most problematic and most important to your customers. These uh, elements that end up in that upper right quadrant are the ones that will have the greatest value to your customers. Successful solutions, whether it's a product or a new business model or a service, address pain points that meet the desired outcomes that are important, have low satisfaction currently, and from a business perspective are differentiated. So again, the desired outcome was a product and vendor that helps me operate my business efficiently by giving me near 100% uptime and high throughput with high diagnostic reliability. And one of the ways to get there is this workflow that shows up as it's problematic for your customers and it's important to your customers. So a final example, a hospital product. This study was to determine, determine optimal pricing and launch timing. So product life cycle 
management. The methodology, again, was a hybrid study, both qual and quant with in-depth interviews and a survey. Now, an IDI is useful to you when you want to elicit pain points. These are in-depth interviews, one-on-one -on -one in-depth interviews, when you want to understand desired outcomes and inform the survey design. The survey in this case was a conjoint design as well as a generated market model. And the reason to use that, even though it's, it's sometimes complicated, it's certainly more costly, but it provides useful quantifiable information to guide strategy. Price sensitivity can be evaluated by quantifying the value of achieving the desired outcomes. Market share can be understood. What percent of the market perceives their desired outcomes are or are not being met? And then using a market model, uh, you can calculate the financial impacts of potential business choices. A conjoint if you've never seen one, which I expect most of you have, is basically it's a choice set that's presented to respondents where they can choose product one, product two, or product three. All of the variables change uh, almost interchangeably. In this case, um, the reason we pulled this example up is to show you that brand is important and you can ask about not just price, but price for purchase, and price for service. There's no reason to have just a single price variable. You can ask about payment models and a variation of these. And these combinations show up and with uh, post-survey analysis, you can get the value of each of these individual attributes and the levels of each. In this case, um, an important finding, and remember early I mentioned that desired outcomes may be different by segment. This was an example where that was the case. And in fact, customers did not perceive value the same way as the company did. And you may find this as well if you're open-minded and approach these um, challenges not as features and benefits, but what are the unmet needs of your customers? And then using conjoint and a simulator, you can quantify how well those potential solutions deliver the desired outcomes to different customer groups. In this case, the history of the client, they were looking at replacing an older product with a newer one. And they were wondering about timing, when to announce it, how to price the new product. And what was discovered, and, and you may find this too, is that a large percentage of their uh, segments, in fact a majority of their customers, saw things differently and they actually valued the older product more than the new one. But their R&D team, their sales force, and the company advisors, their key opinion leaders, were generally in the, in the same mode of seeing these new features as very important to them, and they were, but not to the majority of the customers. So there was that bias by listening just to your own teams. So adding the quantitative market model, in this case, quantify the impact of price on preference and profitability, including both product and service plans. And you can understand the impact of launch timing on revenues, market share, and profitability. And you can quantify the impact of various product portfolio options on market share like this, where having two products, the existing legacy product and the new product priced appropriately, the new product with the right uh, combination of features to meet the unmet needs of one group, the older product with a new pricing plan and business model made it much more appealing to another segment of their product and they had the opportunity to gain market share in this space from 68 to 74 percent by modifying their product portfolio and this all came about because they understood that they had two groups with two different desired set, sets of desired outcomes. In this case these two segments had different desired outcomes. One group needed to be able to do certain functions with a pricing scheme that fits our business model. The other segment needed to be able to do similar things, but for a very large patient population, so our staff doesn't have to spend so much time, and there you get back into the efficiency. And all of this derived from staying open-minded, understanding the desired outcomes of different customers, market segments. So the identification of desired outcomes guides high-value solutions that customers desire and are willing to pay. Value 
is evaluated based on the ability to achieve desired outcomes perfectly, right? Utility over price, that's value. And that translates to desired outcomes relative to willingness to pay. And willingness to pay will be dependent on how perfectly your offer helps the customer achieve their desired outcome. In other words, how well does the solution that you offer help a customer get their job done? So problem identification and extraction investigation identifies the innovation opportunities. The opportunities are the desired outcomes that customers value, and those are the things they're willing to pay for. So you extract a customer's desired outcomes. It can provide strategic guidance for specific solutions, and you can quantify the value of those solutions by how well they meet the desired outcomes. So that's an overview of how a pie process can help you make better business decisions. Gather users' needs in terms of problems and desired outcomes. Articulate those desired outcomes to guide development and create better business models. It's not always about the product. Understand which solutions have real value. And value, of course, is how which can best achieve the desired outcomes in terms of speed, consistency, and outputs and quantify the price premium if you use a quantitative step. And eventually you can develop, sell, and pitch the right product at the right price. Now most products and services only deliver part of the desired outcome. And a well-designed research project to identify those problems and extract them will help you understand the complete needs, problems, and the desired outcomes so that you can optimize product features and product portfolio. You can better target messaging because you understand your customers and their needs better. You offer more appealing business models. You can establish a competitive advantage and connect better with your customers because now you feel their pain. So three things to remember. One, desired outcomes are consistent. Technology solutions are dynamic. They change. But if you understand the desired outcomes, you can modify and offer the technology that best solves their problems and meets the desired outcomes of your customers. Second, customers do know what they want in terms of desired outcomes, but they often can't articulate solutions. And third, successful products are those that help customers perfectly achieve their desired outcomes those three things we talked about. And actually, there, there's a fourth item. Properly using these methodologies to capture customers' desired outcomes is not easy. It's a learned skill. So be sure that you train your team members or hire people that are methodology experts, that are objective observational experts, and that they're process and metrics-oriented experts. On behalf of the Market Tech Group, We'd like to thank everyone for your participation and for the questions from the audience. I hope I've answered those as we went through the presentation. After the webinar, if you could just take a moment to complete a survey that will pop up, we really appreciate it. Remember, the Market Tech Group is a medical consulting firm, but also a market research firm. So we really do appreciate and thrive on feedback. Good day, everyone. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.